Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The prodigal son, it's a popular story, isn't it? It's a, a rebellious child, dishonors his father to, to go live a reckless life in, in typical leftist fashion, actually, only to find that life with dad actually wasn't that bad after all, right? This is the general premise of the story. But it's not the whole story. There's more to it. In fact, there's a, there's a whole other brother involved, right? The older brother that we get at the very end of the story. And he's really the punch of the story, the point of the story. He ties back to the very beginning of Luke 15 and those Pharisees and scribes who don't want to draw near to Jesus. He wants to stay outside the house. He wants to self-exclude from dad's celebration with his brother. This is our sermon text today, my friends, as we continue our uh, five-ish week-long reflection on the two different groups of people who populate our world, Christians and everybody else. That's who we have in this world. And by Christians, we mean true Christians, those who are holding the faith and a good conscience, as per our epistle reading today, 1 Timothy 1, verse 19. We're not talking about nominal Christians. We're not talking about those in name only or those who who would consider themselves Christian but are unrepentant of their sin, who are pretending their boats afloat when they've already made shipwreck of their faith. No, we're talking about those who are waging the good warfare. Christians, properly speaking, and everybody else. Now, in terms of our Luke 15 passage, since we read the entire section, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, you could say that these two groups of people in the world are the lost and the found. But when we focus in specifically on the parable of the two brothers and their father, generally known as the prodigal son, we can frame this subject, this this reflection, as those who have already begun to celebrate that the son who was dead has been resurrected and now eat from the Lord's table with gladness in our hearts and those who self-exclude and refuse to go into the Father's house, to partake of their brother's celebratory meal because there's an anger, there's a hardness of heart, there's a perceived, even if false, sense of injustice. And so they set themselves against their Father. And we know the Father to be the Father, our Holy Father, God. But we have Christians and we have everyone else. There are those who repent of their sin, friends, and who and rejoice, right? Who rejoice in the compassion of their father, who, who make the, the decision to turn back to their dad, but even before they can speak the words, even before they can, they can do their part, what they would perceive to be their part, who even before they could confess their sins, experience the compassion of the Father. The Father who runs to them, who embraces them, who kisses them. There are those who are clothed in Christ's robe of righteousness, who have His ring on their finger, who who live as the heirs of the kingdom of God that they are, having gone from dead to alive again. No more stuck in their sin, but through baptismal faith in Christ Jesus, trust in His crucifixion and find assurance in His resurrection from the dead for their own faith in Him, to hold the faith, to have a good conscience, that they can trust this God who has removed their sins. Jesus has been the that he's justified you, dear saints. He's, he's the propitiation for your sins and you can trust this because he got up from the dead. And there are those who refuse 
to repent of their sin, but they choose rather to stay outside of our Father's house, away from the feast being shared by all of us on the inside, by the communion of the saints, not glad out there, but angry. Not alive out there, but dead in their trespasses and sin, waiting really for the day to come where their choice to remain outside the communal celebration of Christ will actually be made permanent and they will forever dwell where they want to be, outside, not in the Father's house, out there where there is only weeping and gnashing of teeth, out in that darkness. So there are the younger brother sort, sinful as we all are, yet repentant. And there are the older brother sort, also sinful, yet unrepentant. Jesus spoke plainly when He said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. He says this in Matthew 10, verses 34 to 36. And it doesn't have to be this way, friends. Don't think this is a, a set rule that your families always have to be divided. No. But where one member of the family is, or any of the members of the family, are repentant and follow Christ, and others, or another isn't and doesn't, a man is set against his father. Just like the older brother in our parable set himself against his father, against his forgiven brother, instead of joining them in their resurrection celebration in the house. These two groups, they really have existed throughout every generation of the church since the apostles. Even before that, back to, to Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, right? The oldest story in the entire world, right? What is it? Boy meets girl. Boy meets girl. That's the oldest story of, of, of humanity of all time. What's the second oldest story? Brother kills brother. The tension between brothers. And so we've seen these groups throughout all mankind, but, but we've definitely seen it throughout all the New Testament church era too. Don't think that just because we live in the, the apostolic age, we've, we've received the wonderful word of the cross that everything's hunky-dory. No, there's still, there's always been this, this division, this tension, this sword, and it affects the church as well. Look at our, our uh, Timothy reading, 1 Timothy, and you'll see there, I extended the reading beyond 17 so that we could get this, this little punch that ties in with our, our parable in the gospel. What do you see there? In the, at the end of the 1 Timothy reading, you see names, names of real people, saints, real people who had at one time been a part of the real Christian family, the congregation that met there in Ephesus, right? Yes. You see the names Hymenaeus and Alexander. And they're included as examples. Examples of how Paul dealt with unrepentant sinners who rejected God's Word and yet wanted to remain in Christ's church. But you can't do both, friend. You can't do both. If you hold on to your sin and you, you're holding on to your Christianity, one of them is false. To continue to walk in darkness when you say you're in the light, well, that's either to lie or to make God a liar. Which one is it? And God cannot lie. So it is to lie. It is to live a lie. Christ's sword is real. It's one or the other. It's not pleasant, but when unrepentant sinners emerge in the church, when they, when they rise up in the church, when they reveal themselves, when it becomes aware, we become aware, it becomes obvious that someone's living in their sin, doesn't want to repent of it, it becomes necessary to hold faith so that Christians can have a good conscience. And so we note what we read here at the end of 1 Timothy 1, who, who, uh, who rejected the Word of God. 
Here it's referred to as the prophecies, right? Who, who rejected God's Word? It wasn't Paul. It wasn't the church. It was Hymenaeus and Alexander. Just like the younger brother in our parable at the beginning of the story, right? At the beginning of our gospel lesson, he rejected his father, basically said, drop dead, dad. Give me your inheritance. I want to go party with the prostitutes. But then we see in his story, he repents and comes home. And just like the older brother at the end of Luke 15, who likewise rejected his father, but we never see his repentant story. It's left in tension. But just like these two incidences of, of living in sin, Hymenaeus and Alexander rejected our Father's word. They rejected His way. They rejected the truth. They rejected life. They're rejecting Christ. And even though Paul says he handed them over to Satan, that's what he says, it wasn't Paul who rejected Hymenaeus and Alexander. No. That's not how excommunication works. Excommunication is self-exclusion. They rejected God's Word. And so Paul, the church, carried out his and its duty faithfully. Last week, last week we acknowledged in our voters' meeting that this very same thing still happens today. Sadly, still happens today. Today, our brother James chose to self-exclude from our Father's house and our Lord's table where we celebrate the resurrection of Christ with gladness. We celebrate the Son who was dead and is alive again with gladness. And if it happened for Jesus, if He could get up from the dead, if there can be a resurrection for Christ, there can be a resurrection for that younger brother who repents, there is a resurrection for you who repent of your sin and come into the feast. And there are those then also who are like the older brother and Hymenaeus and Alexander and and our duty when they emerge among us is simply to acknowledge their decision to reject God's Word, to reject the Father. And should our brother choose not to live like the older brother? Should he choose to repent and come home as we pray he will like the younger brother? Well, then our duty is to receive Him as one who was dead but is now alive again. Our duty is to receive Him with celebration and gladness. And it's a duty we look forward to. This is Christianity, saints. This is Christianity. This is how our God is, isn't it? We heard it in the Micah reading from our Old Testament lesson. Who is a God like you, we read, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He doesn't retain anger forever, his anger forever, because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. We heard about this with the Father in the parable. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all of our sins into the depth of of the sea. And so, this is who we are to be. This is who we are to strive to be as Christians, just as we read in 1 Timothy 1, verses 13 to 19, and other places as well, but this makes the point. Therefore, this is talking to you, Christian, prepare, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, as obedient sons. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. The younger brother lived in his former ignorance, but he wasn't conformed to that. He came home. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on Him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, 
Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, church. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Praise be to Jesus, right? Praise be to Christ. He died to pardon your iniquity and to cast your sin into the depth of the sea. So saint, Christian, friend, if you've been holding on to some anger, brother, repent. Repent. Don't hold on to that anger. Don't live like the older brother in our parable this morning, angry and refusing to enjoy the resurrection celebration that is our Father's and is therefore yours. Right? This is what he tells the brother. All that's mine is yours. You've been here the whole time. It's yours, son. Don't compare yourself to the other brother. Live in what is yours. Everything that God is God's, He's giving it to you through Christ Jesus. It's yours right now. Not it will be yours. It is yours. Have a glad heart right now and enjoy the gifts that your Father gives you. First article gifts and second article gifts. Live in the gladness of a, of a heart that delights in the resurrection of Jesus. Be the prodigal son. Not before his repentance, but afterwards. Come home. If you've lived recklessly, if you've been squandering your father's property, and, and that could be in time, it can be in how you treat your body, you are your father's property. You're a steward of all the things, everything that you think is yours, that you think you own, <laughs> even yourself, none of it's yours. It all belongs to God. He, he allows us to manage the things that we have, our time, our materials, our goods, but they're not ours. That's a misnomer. They're His. We're simply taking care of them. So if you've been living recklessly and you've been squandering your father's property like the younger brother did, acting as if God was dead, well then repent. Repent, Christian, and come home. Turn away from the filth of your life lived with the pigs and see that your father has come to you. He has come to you with great compassion for you in your crucified Savior. He has come to you. You are forgiven. So eat and celebrate with gladness. If you've slipped from holding the faith, if your conscience isn't good, but is rather burdened, burdened by your sins, repent and confess those sins that you may receive forgiveness. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't leave it hanging like that. The end of our story. Don't leave it in tension. Come home. Repent. Don't reject the word of your Father whose Spirit has come out to you and entreat you to be glad. For this my Son was dead and is alive again. You, friends, you were lost in your sins. But you're found. In baptismal repentance in Christ Jesus, our Lord, to God be the glory, you are found. Which of us isn't a rebellious child who dishonors our Father's goods and property and lives a reckless life? And yet I'm speaking to a room full of Christians. So which of us hasn't realized that life with capital D Dad isn't that bad after all? May we not be blasphemers like Hymenaeus and Alexander, but may we continue to wage the good warfare against our own sins first and foremost and against the sins of those who Satan would use to upset the faith of some. And that is to say, dear saints, may you and I always repent of our sins 
and rejoice in the compassion of our Heavenly Father who has ran out to us, embraced us, kissed us, clothed us with Christ's robe of righteousness, making us heirs of the kingdom of God. No longer dead in your sin, but alive in Christ Jesus. So be glad. And now come. Let us eat. And let us celebrate. Amen.